So let me introduce Dr. David uh, Smith. He is at NASA Ames, and he's currently the Deputy Chief of the Space Biosciences Research uh, Branch. Uh, David is one of the great young uh, crop of astrobiologists coming up, and he has been studying lately, amongst his many uh, interests, uh, aerobiology. And uh, some of the first uh, advances in that field uh, happened when I was a graduate student back in the mid-'80s. So this has been a, a field that has taken quite a long time to mature, and now David has thrown himself into it with a vengeance, and we want to hear all about that. So please welcome David Smith. Thank you very much. It's a joy to be here. As Penny mentioned, I'm just down the road at NASA Ames, and I'm honored to be speaking to a room full of my scientific heroes and explorers. And uh, I'm going to talk about aerobiology. I hope you've never heard the term, quite frankly, so you'll learn something new here in the next 10 minutes. Uh, I want to change the way that you think about clouds, particularly if you're taking an airplane home. So I'm asking the question, why aren't clouds green? And you know we're familiar with a lot of biosignatures. We can see some biosignatures from space. Of course, you can see vegetation. But what's shown here is this beautiful marine phytoplankton bloom. So I guess I could have titled my talk, Why Aren't Clouds Teal? But you get the point. Uh, these things are so heavily concentrated that it's a sign of life that we can actually see with our eyeballs from orbit. And that's pretty remarkable. I like this image as well because you can't really tell what's a bloom and what's a cloud, right? So I think we forget oftentimes that we are bottom dwellers, right? We're living under an ocean of atmosphere, in a sense. So one more nice image. And just to drive the point home, why are we seeing microbial blooms here and not here? And I'm going to tell you a little bit about the environments of clouds, but the overarching point is that there's water available and there's food available. So uh, should we be thinking about clouds as an environment for life here on Earth, but also life in the solar system and beyond? So forgive the very elementary atmosphere diagram, but I just want to make sure everybody's on the same page. Most of the clouds on this planet are contained within the bottom portion of Earth's atmosphere or the troposphere. You can see that depicted on this chart. And if you follow that yellow line, I think you'll get one answer to the question I posed in the talk title. Uh, as you get higher above the surface, it gets very, very cold. Um, that changes as you enter the stratosphere. And uh, where the ozone layer is, you get this inversion. The temperature goes up, but there's a trade-off there because then you get more radiation from the sunlight. There's another answer to the title of my talk. So this is just a visual depiction of what I just showed you. Most of the cloud deck is contained within the troposphere. This is a nice thunderstorm. You can see it topping out there. Um, Earth, as you know, has a lot of convection, right? So a lot of the stuff on the surface gets swept up by winds. And that stuff does contain microorganisms. So we haven't been thinking enough about clouds and the potential for an atmospheric oasis of sorts, right? As that uh, microbial matter gets lifted up, the question is, is it doing anything or is it just going along for a ride? So I want to talk about that today and bring you up to speed on what uh, the international aerobiology community is doing. So I'm really passionate about this subject. I started an uh, aerobiology lab just down the road at NASA. We use high-flying aircraft. We use balloons. And we used fixed observatories to try and answer some of these basic questions about what's there, where is it coming from, and most importantly for this audience today, what is it doing? So I love this painted Earth animation. This is derived from satellite data. Everything you see there is a distinct type of aerosol. And the point I want to make is you've got these global circulation patterns, and each color is transporting microorganisms as well. We know this based on some pretty sparse field measurements. You have a lot of microbial matter that are riding along with these other abiotic aerosols. Um, I know what it's like to, to be on the other end in the room, and you may not remember a word I say, but I'm hoping this visual will stick with you today. Beautiful stuff. 
This is jaw dropping. So a lot of these are derived numbers, but we think anywhere from five to 50% of atmospheric aerosols greater than two microns are biological in nature. That's a pretty stunning thing to consider. Here are some of the other categories you can see depicted in this uh, table. So as I mentioned before, this shouldn't surprise you much considering most microorganisms are the same size or smaller than some of the other more familiar atmospheric aerosols, right? We've all looked up into the sky and seen dust or smoke. Uh, the microorganisms are not concentrated enough to see with your eyes, but we know they're there. And we know that the amount of time they spend in the atmosphere can be pretty significant on the order of hours, days, or even weeks. The smaller you are, the longer you can stay aloft. So the mantra in my lab has been follow the dust. And the reason for that is a lot of microorganisms are stuck onto dust particles. And we're particularly interested, in, if you think back to that painted earth video animation of the transoceanic corridors, the, the highways in the sky, if you will, because the, they're somewhat predictable, they're seasonal, particularly over the Pacific Ocean, we get a lot of Asian dust coming to North America. So we're trying to capture that in the air and also on the coastline where it's arriving to understand exactly what's going on. I mentioned that a lot of soil microorganisms are stuck on those dust particles. The ones I think are really interesting because we see so many of them in atmosphere samples are bacterial endospores. So that's a survival trick, essentially, to hunker down and withstand extreme conditions that you would expect in the upper atmosphere. It's very cold, it's very dry, it's highly irradiated, and these things are surviving, which is extraordinary. So the bottom line here, I know not everybody's a microbiologist, is when we sample the air in the troposphere and to some extent the lower stratosphere, what we find, the the types of bioaerosols are pretty representative of what you would find in marine and surface environments as well. There's a great amount of richness, which is what we're depicting here with the different colors, the different phyla. So, okay, there's a lot of diversity, but as I asked before, is it doing anything? Or is it just kind of moving along these corridors? This is a recent book that was published. I think it's extremely informative. It summarizes some of the contemporary literature on this topic. Um, and this chapter in particular discusses the possible signs of activity. So I, I wanna go into that briefly without getting into the weeds here. So the first point is the concentrations are pretty significant in clouds. I'm summarizing that for bacteria and fungi. Uh, there's also food available, so you can see the types of organics that microorganisms are known to use on the ground or in fresh or marine water environments. So basically, there's enough there to do something. There's food and water there to do something. And some groundwork published in 2001 suggested uh, that you could get bacterial growth in supercooled cloud droplets. About 12 years later, this was followed by uh, a study which took actual cloud water samples, put them in an environmental chamber, and also noticed the biotransformation of some of those organics that were available. And they suggested that biotransformation was actually done by the microorganisms in the cloud water sample and not through, co through photochemistry. This is a recent paper that came out a couple years ago, which was extremely interesting, done at an Alpine observatory in Central Oregon. And they measured atmosphere samples in the presence of short-lived molecular transcripts, RNA. And they inferred that as a sign of molecular activity. But I think more work needs to be done in this area. I wanna just give you some more visuals because I'm talking about stuff we can't see, microorganisms. This was a, a video we put together with the California Academy of Sciences illustrating um, the point that we know microbes are getting swept into the atmosphere. What are they doing? So what goes up must come down, right? I mentioned before that the bigger you are, the shorter lived your time in the atmosphere is. So there's wet and dry deposition. The interesting thing about wet deposition is that the microorganisms can actually act as ice and cloud condensation nuclei. It turns out Pseudomonas, Pseudomonas uh, as you see here, has some proteins on the outside of its membrane that allow 
the nuclei to freeze at higher temperatures uh, than would be expected otherwise in the cloud. So in a sense, this microorganism, we think, is building its own parachute to return to the surface, in a sense. Bioprecipitation is the idea. But more measurements are certainly needed in this area. And I think what the field is lacking in general is in situ measurements. So that's what's uh, happening across the field. And we're, we're doing these studies using a variety of platforms. About five years ago, when I was at Kennedy Space Center, we used a blimp to fly through clouds. I also mentioned that you can use fixed observatories. My brilliant colleague down the road, Diana Gentry at NASA Ames, has some support through the NASA Office of the Chief Scientist to fly drones through cloud banks here in the San Francisco Bay Area. This is really exciting work. This is the Alpine Observatory in Central Oregon. I mentioned uh, when I was at the University of Washington in their astrobiology program, we did some work there. You can see the cloud deck passes through that observatory. I mentioned chambers are a great way to study these questions. And I want to revisit the sunlight problem. So I think one of the most limiting factors of not only meaningful metabolic activity, but surviving the atmospheric corridors is the ultraviolet irradiation, particularly uh, once you get into and above the ozone layer. And so I think we need to be a little conservative thinking about uh, what microorganisms are doing and whether or not we consider clouds an ecosystem for that reason. As you can see depicted in black, thankfully we are protected from most of the low wavelength ultraviolet light because of that ozone layer. As you get higher, uh, it gets more intense, therefore more biocidal for anything that's up there. Biocidal in the sense that ultraviolet light can damage DNA. So this is a payload I built with collaborators at Kennedy Space Center to basically take types of bacteria, put them in the upper atmosphere, and measure just how biocidal those conditions are. So we can establish a, an experimental time series, essentially taking known quantities of those microbes that are alive when we start the experiment, and then allow them to drift through the atmosphere for eight hours in this case, and plot the death. And so what you see plotted here is actually logarithmic in activation curve. And on the bottom right of this image, you can see the types of life that we sent up. These are bacterial endospores. So these are some of the most resistant, resilient types of life we know, but they still get killed pretty quickly in the atmosphere. And we know that it's the sunlight doing it and not the other atmospheric conditions because we protect a subset of samples from the sunlight and they do just fine. That's what you see on the top. So they're not bothered by the dryness or the thin air or the cold temperatures. So I want to revisit the question, why aren't clouds green? I hope I've provided some insight. I don't want to discourage the exploration of clouds on other worlds, but uh, I want to at least provide uh, the latest information about what we know here on, on, on Earth about clouds. Through atmospheric surveys, most of what we find is, is great in richness and abundance, but dead or dormant. I mentioned before that the atmosphere is extremely cold, and we know that there is a lower limit for microbial metabolism, growth, and division. And so for that reason, it would be difficult to, to have a lot of productivity while aloft. And also the time scales of staying afloat are very, very small. I mentioned before, the bigger you are, the faster you fall. So I'm not going to steal David Grinspoon's thunder. He's up next. But just because there are some known constraints on cloud life here on Earth, doesn't mean we shouldn't pay attention to other uh, cloud systems. So he's going to talk more about that. I'm very intrigued by this system. We just published a paper three weeks ago in astrobiology describing um, what that might look like. Um, pretty comfortable temperatures. How the life would stay aloft is something I think we need to uh, consider as well. He'll talk more about that, I'm sure. And you know, just in conclusion, as a, an aerobiologist and astrobiologist, I'm, I'm frustrated by this image, of course, looking through the Earth's atmosphere, because we see these clouds. We know life is there. But right now, we can't detect that biosignature, either remotely or even really well with uh, flying platforms. So I want to keep pushing on the aerobiology front, because I think it is directly relevant to astrobiology, particularly in the sense that imagine a really densely concentrated airborne ecology Right? Think of those phytoplankton blooms I showed you at the beginning of this presentation. 
if you had a dense enough concentration in an exoplanet atmosphere, could you detect that? And I would love to pick some brains here at the meeting and, and talk more about that, because I think it's an exciting idea, albeit a little far-fetched, but an exciting idea. So in conclusion, I want to thank my sponsors, some of whom are in the room. I work in a very uh, forgiving and patient organization at NASA Ames that does a lot of applied research on the space station, but they allow me to explore these basic fundamental biology questions in the atmosphere, and I'm grateful to them. And I must say, on a personal note, I'm grateful to this man, Pete Warden, for bringing me to California a few years ago when I asked. You did not need to do that, but you helped me out, and it's changed my life. Thank you very much. Can you afford a house? No, I can't. <laughs> I'm Thank you. Okay. Uh, nice talk. Thank you. So you mentioned implications for Venus, but I was wondering if you might step a little bit further towards the outer planets uh, where gravity may be less and the atmosphere might be thicker, such as Titan. I haven't given it any thought. We should talk. We should. Yeah. I wonder if uh, there is any evidence for uh, atmosphere, Earth atmosphere-specific microbes. So. Um, as far as you can see, is it all uh, soil and marine microbes, or can there be some evidence for, for microbes that actually enjoy being up there? So if I understand your question, are you asking, is there anything that seems to be native or unique to the atmosphere in terms of what we detect? Yeah. Okay. And be, being the, the, active the problem with that in microbiology, if you want to call it a problem, is that you know, we're, we're finding new species all of the time. And so just because we find it in the atmosphere doesn't mean that it's native to the atmosphere, right? Like, if I were to swab this podium and take it back to the lab, there's a pretty good chance that we would find something that nobody's found before. So it's difficult to answer that question. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I am under the impression from the looking into this that I've done because of Enceladus that A, there are microbes that are colorless. So you shouldn't be worried about whether or not they're green because maybe sure. there's just no need for them to have chlorophyll. Sure. And two, uh, I've also learned that just about every frost particle on Earth and even in the atmosphere has a microorganism at, at the center of it. Uh, so I'm surprised to hear you say that clouds that are, you know, they're white, they're colorless, um, don't have organisms? Is that what you're saying? They don't have any organisms? There's in? plenty of them in there. Whether or not we can see them through remote methods is kind of what I'm implying. How, how do we detect them is the question. If we know they're there, but maybe not high enough concentration, and if they are not pigmented, how do we detect them? What we find through atmosphere samples that are not clouds is that a lot of the survivors are pigmented. These are red cells, these are orange cells, and that pigmentation may allow some buffering of that intense sunlight. So I still would expect to see some of that. If we've got things in the atmosphere surviving in clouds, I would expect them, based on our measurements today, to have some sort of pigmentation. 